tonight, our last installment of our Science of Science Fiction series. I'm very excited to learn more about genetics. Um, it's genetic engineering from Jurassic Park to Gattaca, and we have Professor Ryan Gutenkunst, uh, and he's in the Department of Molecular Cellular Biology and Bio5. Um, so can we have a big round of applause and a warm welcome for Dr. Gutenkunst. Well, thank you all, and thank you for coming out on what turned out to be a beautiful night. And in today's talk, I really, I hope to raise a lot of issues for discussion that, to be frank, I don't know the answers about because they're really questions that we as a society have to address. And I, on the science fiction side, I want to frame our discussion in terms of two modern classics of science fiction cinema, Jurassic Park and Gattaca, which both raise, um, use genetic engineering and t think about the both the promise and the peril of the power of changing genomes and thus changing living organisms. And so why I'm particularly excited to talk about this topic is that science, in this case, science fiction really is becoming science fact very, very rapidly. And in just the last couple years, there's been a revolution in biotechnology and our ability to edit genomes, which is really opening up vast landscapes and really expanding the possibilities. And now is the time that we as a society have to worry about how will we grapple with this power. But first, let's begin with Jurassic Park. Many of you are probably familiar with this classic, modern classic of science fiction. The movie, of course, centers around the idea of recreating dinosaurs and hatching them by recovering their DNA inserting it into the genomes of living organisms. Here we see the birth of a adorable baby velociraptor. If you've seen the movie, you know that it begins as a festive theme park atmosphere and things don't exactly go smoothly. But, indeed. But for our purposes, let's focus on the science here of what exactly does one need to do to create a dinosaur? And the first step is you have to get, a, get dinosaur DNA. Right? DNA is the blueprint of a living organism. So where does the dinosaur DNA come from in Jurassic Park? And this is a case where I think the movie itself explains it in a much more entertaining way than I possibly could. So let me just roll you this clip. What? What? Oh, <laughs> Mr. DNA, where did you come from? From your blood. Just one drop of your blood contains billions of strands of DNA, the building blocks of life. A DNA strand like me is a blueprint for building a living thing. And sometimes animals that went extinct millions of years ago, like dinosaurs, left their blueprints behind for us to find. We just had to know where to look. A hundred million years ago, there were mosquitoes, just like today. And just like today, they fed on the blood of animals, even dinosaurs. Sometimes, after biting a dinosaur, the mosquito would land on the branch of a tree and get stuck in the sap. After a long time, the tree sap would get hard and become fossilized, just like a dinosaur bone, preserving the mosquito inside. This fossilized tree sap, which we call amber, waited for millions of years with the mosquito inside until Jurassic Park scientists came along. Using sophisticated techniques, they extract the preserved blood from the mosquito and, bingo, dino DNA. A full DNA strand contains three billion genetic codes. If we looked at screens like these once a second for eight hours a day, it'd take two years to look at the entire DNA strain. It's that long. So, to create a dinosaur, we first have to get a hold of Mr. DNA. And 
in Jurassic Park, they do that from mosquitoes preserved in amber that has existed for millions of years. And if you've been following the science news in the last week, you may recognize this specimen. Um, so amber actually has given us a lot of insight into dinosaurs. If you didn't follow the story, so this is a piece of amber that a paleontologist discovered actually in a, in a mineral market in China uh, for sale. And she recognized that this fuzzy thing in here um, was not some weird plant. It's actually part of a baby dinosaur's tail. And the fuzziness here are thin, wispy feathers that covered that tail. So many of us grew up with this image of dinosaurs as these sort of scaly, lizard-looking things. Um, but many dinosaurs, we now know, likely had feathers. Not necessarily for flight, but for perhaps insulation or other sorts of qualities. So we can definitely get material from dinosaurs embedded in amber. But what about the blood? What about the DNA? Now, unfortunately, here I have to be a little, of a, little bit of a killjoy. So a 2013 study showed that DNA is actually very poorly preserved in amber. Even samples just a few thousand years old, much less millions of years old, you basically can't get any DNA out. And the problem is that what really kills DNA and prevents it from being preserved is temperature. Fluctuations in temperature or high temperature cause all the chemical bonds within DNA to break apart. And then essentially you're left with a meaningless jumble of chemicals rather than that nice ordered sequence of A's, C's, T's, and G's that really specifies the organism. So while I'm sure we would all love to see a Tyrannosaurus walking around, we don't have DNA, dino DNA so we're not going to get dinosaurs this way. Sorry to spoil the movie. But dinosaurs may be the most big and impressive of extinct animals. But there are lots of other really cool animals out there that we could think about reviving. Does anyone recognize this? What is it? Ah, exactly. So this is a baby mammoth found in Siberia. Um, not, not so photogenic right now. But roughly 30 to 40,000 years ago, this baby mammoth died and froze and was then covered in permafrost. So until scientists dug this mammoth up, it was frozen for 30 to 40,000 years. And so in this case, we have very cold storage, and we have a lot of material. So we have all the mammoth DNA we could possibly want. And just a couple years ago, in fact, the mammoth genome was sequenced from, I'm not sure about whether it was this one, but from a frozen mammoth. And that revealed that mammoths differ genetically from Asian elephants by about 0.05%. So what is that? That is about one in 2,000 locations in the genome are different. And to put that in perspective, um, mammoths are closer, are more closely related to Asian elephants than Indian elephants are to Asian elephants. And to put this 0.05% number into perspective, the difference between humans and chimpanzees is about 1%. So, we're, so mammoths are about 20 times close, more closely related to elephants than we are to chimpanzees. And those differences, um, if, you, if you had a little bit of biology, you, you may remember that most of the work in an organism, most of the sort of functional things that cells do, are determined by proteins. And those differences between mammoths and elephants are concentrated in about 1,600 proteins where there seem to be differences that might affect how they function. So if you wanted to turn the genome of an elephant into the genome of a mammoth, you need to make about 1,600 changes. Now, just five years ago, if someone had proposed editing a genome in 1,600 places, 
they would have been told that was insanity. Impossible. You'll never do it. But all that has changed. And I now want to turn to talking about the technology that has created that change. And it all starts here. So this is a lovely, tempting bowl of yogurt. And as you may or may not know, the way we get milk, the way we turn milk into yogurt is really driven by bacteria that introduce into the milk, we will introduce a culture of very specific bacteria that will digest certain sugars in the milk. And as the bacteria grow and divide, they curdle the milk into the yogurt. So if you're Danon or some other company that makes millions of tons of yogurt, you care a lot about the health of your bacteria. And over 20 years ago, Francisco Mojica in Spain began looking at, um, began examining the sequences of lots of bacterial genomes. And he noticed something weird. He noticed these strange bits of what looks like what looked like viral DNA inside the bacterial genomes. And it took him about a 12 years sort of working in scientific obscurity until in 2005 he realized and showed that this viral DNA that was living inside the bacterium was really part of an immune system. So just like we have an immune system that can recognize viruses and fight them off, especially once we've seen them before. That's what immunizations do. Bacteria also have an adaptive immune system where if one of these bacterium is infected with a virus and happens to survive, it can copy part of that viral genome into its own genome as a sort of as a memory. And then that bacterium and all its descendants will be prepared to fight off that virus if it comes. So I mentioned that this work was done really in scientific obscurity, right? Um, you know, the yogurt manufacturers might have cared, but most people don't care about the adaptive immune systems of bacteria. And this work really only took off in 2012. That's when Jennifer Dudna, now at Stanford, um, showed that CRISPR and Cas9, which are the components of that bacterial immune system, can be used to very precisely edit DNA in a test tube. And just a few months later, Lin Zhang and George Church showed that the same technology could be used to, not just in a test tube, but in actual cells. In this case, yeast cells and cultured human cells. And if you've been following sort of the biotechnology business news at all, um, this technology is now the center of a multi-billion dollar patent fight between MIT and Stanford, arguing over who really had the key ideas. But let me step back a little bit and tell you a little bit about what exactly is going on here at the molecular level. So we have our DNA strand that we want to edit. And the magic of this system really comes down to one protein, Cas9, here drawn is this sort of turquoise blob. And one RNA, a molecule kind of like DNA that we can use as a guide. And the way bacteria use this protein is that when they store the viral DNA in their genome, they use it to make these RNAs. And that RNA is long enough that it can very specifically bind to the matching viral DNA. And when it does, this Cas9 protein comes along and cuts the DNA. So if you're a virus, having your DNA cut is basically death. But if you're a genetic engineer, cutting DNA is the first step. Because once you've cut the DNA, the cell will want to repair that break in the DNA. And if there is donor DNA, some DNA that you've introduced into the cell floating around, one way that the cell can repair that damage is by inserting that donor DNA. So the magic and why this is a billion dollar technology 
is that it's so simple from a technology perspective. That it's one protein and one RNA that can be custom made. So previous approaches to editing DNA in yeast or um, human cells or whatever organism you have used to involve arduous experiments that would take weeks. Now with this system, you can do it in a couple days, maybe even a, a few hours. So it really has been a order of magnitude improvement in our ability to edit DNA. And I think it's a beautiful example of how sort of basic science research that really didn't have much application to begin with has resulted in this amazing technology that will, as we'll discuss, have big implications for the rest of our society. So we have CRISPR. Now, in the last couple of years, we have a greatly enhanced ability to edit DNA. Let's return to the mammoths. So I told you that a few years ago, 1,600 changes would have been thought insane. Now those changes are being made. So there is an ongoing project to edit an elephant genome using elephant cells in culture. This isn't a full-grown elephant, but elephant cells living in a Petri dish. And to change the genome of those cells to get as close as possible to a living, breathing, woolly mammoth genome. And they have a website you can visit. It's quite entertaining. Um, and in fact, they have plans to revive a lot of other extinct animals. The dodo bird, um, the mammoth, anything, the saber-toothed tiger, for example. Um, so this, is quite, this, to me, is amazing, right? That we could actually go and visit the mammoth, and potentially, in a few years. Um, but this already starts to raise ethical questions. Um, perhaps the most important, most obvious one is you have a mammoth. Where does it live? And how does it live? Right? Mammoths are big animals. Their territory is in has been changed dramatically in the last 10, 30,000 years. And perhaps more importantly, um, elephants and presumably mastodons are very intelligent animals. Right? What makes an elephant is not just its DNA. It's also its history and its culture. Because of course, elephant mothers have been teaching elephant children for generations upon generations how to live and how to be an elephant. And that information is not carried in the DNA. That's carried through this culture of the elephants. So there is an ongoing project to create a woolly mammoth and revive them. This whole movement has gotten the term de-extinction. What are some other things we might want to revive? Well, I happen to work on human evolutionary genetics as my research. And so if I had my choice, I would love to be able to interact with a Neanderthal. So remember that I told you that mammoths differ from Asian elephants by about 0.05% at the DNA level. Modern humans differ from Neanderthals by about 0.3%. So about a factor of five or six more differences. But once you can turn an elephant into a mammoth, turning the human embryo into a, into a Neanderthal, Neanderthal embryo is really just a question of scale, not of any fundamental difference in the technology. But here, of course, the ethical questions are even thornier. Right? As much as an anthropologist would love to interact with a Neanderthal, part of the reason that would be interesting is that all the archaeological evidence suggests that Neanderthals were probably as intelligent as modern humans. So Neanderthals had art. They had complicated burial rituals. Um, they had complicated hunting strategies. We have no record of, whether they, um, of what their speech may have been like, but we have no reason to believe it was any less complex than humans, than modern humans. Right, in fact, their brains are actually bigger than ours. So a very crucial ethical question here is, could science ethically revive and study a Neanderthal? Right? I mean, this, is, this would definitely be an individual right, who 
would have, would, I would argue, should have the same rights as any one of us. Who would be thrust into a society that they would be essentially unprepared to deal with. So, de extinction has lots of promise, right? We might want to revive the dodo bird and fix some of the mistakes humans have made as we've changed the globe. But how far back do we go and where do we draw the line? So now I want to turn to our second movie and think not about how we can create other organisms, but what can we do to ourselves? And so Gattaca is, I think, another modern classic of science fiction. You're probably less familiar with it than you are with Jurassic Park. But Gattaca tells the story of a society in which genetic engineering of humans is widespread, as is genetic testing. And because of that, society is divided into a genetically engineered upper class and a minority underclass of those unfortunate humans who were born naturally, who were conceived naturally. And just to plug the movie because I love it, Ethan Hawke plays Victor, a young man who had the misfortune of being conceived naturally, but wishes to essentially become an astronaut. And so because of his genetic heritage, that avenue is completely closed off to him. And so he has to engage in ever more elaborate deceptions to obscure his DNA and essentially hide behind the cloak of another person's genome. It's really a wonderful movie. But for us, for me, the discussion in the movie that is most salient comes very early on when Victor's parents, regretting their mistake of conceiving a child naturally, go to their local geneticist to have their second child. And this is a conversation that isn't happening yet, but may be happening for us in the not too distant future. You have specified hazel eyes, dark hair, and uh, fair skin. I have taken the liberty of eradicating any potentially prejudicial conditions, uh, premature baldness, myopia, alcoholism, and addictive susceptibility, uh, propensity for violence, obesity, etc. We didn't want, I mean, diseases, yes, but. Uh... Right, we were just wondering if, if it's good to just leave a few things to, to chance. You want to give your child the best possible start. Believe me, we have enough imperfection built in already. So this conversation is a little worrisome, right? I think we all do want to give our children the best start, right? And if you knew that you could make your child better in some sense, would you do it? But what are the implications for society if it becomes widespread or if it becomes the purview of the wealthy but not the rest of us? So before we can jump into some of those ethical considerations deeply, we need to ask, do we know what changes we would want to make? How well do we know the human genome in terms of understanding how we could change a genome to change the traits of the person that would be born? So beginning with maybe the most clear-cut cases, many genetic disorders could be prevented by editing a single gene in an individual's offspring. So not editing 1,600 places to turn a mammoth, an elephant into a mammoth, but editing one place to have a child that doesn't have cystic fibrosis or doesn't have sickle cell anemia or Marfan syndrome. This is perhaps a line that many of us will be willing to cross. What about some of the less obvious cases? So. There are also traits that aren't themselves diseases that we could introduce by changing a single gene. For example, some people can already, there are already people out there who carry a mutation that makes them immune to HIV infection, the virus that causes AIDS. And these people have been very heavily studied. As far as we know, there's no deleterious effects to this mutation. 
why not give your child that mutation? But you could even go farther. So this gentleman here is, I'm going to butcher this pronunciation, I'm sorry for any Finnish people in the audience, is Ero Mantianta, um, who was a Finnish gold medalist um, uh, cross-country skier. And if you follow the sports world at all, you may know that Lance Armstrong, a hero of American bicycling, has now been disgraced by um, admissions that he doped. And much of the doping he did was blood doping to alter his levels of a protein called EPO. So Arrow, he and his family happened to carry a mutation in his, in his EPO gene that does the exact same thing as the doping does. So it's estimated that his blood could carry 50% more oxygen than someone who did not have that mutation. So he was naturally blood doping. And so if you would like to have your child be a world-class endurance athlete, you should probably give them that trait. And once you start thinking about those sorts of enhancements, there may be lots of things you would like to change. And many of them are more complicated. So some traits are very simple, just single genes. Many traits are genetically much more complex um, that involve tens or hundreds or even thousands of genes. Um, so height is one example. Height is very obviously genetically determined, right? The heights of the parents are very predictive about the height of the child. But it turns out that there are thousands of genes that influence height. So if you wanted to genetically change someone's height, you would have to make a lot of changes to do anything substantial. Risk of cardiovascular disease is similar, again, determined by hundreds or thousands of genes. Um, and perhaps most controversial, IQ has a strong genetic component, but is very complicated genetically with lots of factors. So there are some changes that would be very straightforward to make, and we know the genetic basis. Others would be, other traits would be much more complicated to, to, to change. So where is the science now? I told you that just three years ago, we showed that we could use CRISPR to edit DNA inside cells. And the implications of this for humanity are um, perhaps chilling. So in January of last year, an international group of scientists, uh, actually led by Jennifer Dudna, one of the creators of CRISPR, um, met and called for a moratorium on the use of CRISPR editing of human reproductive cells. So that we as scientists should hold the line and refuse to do this in the clinic. Um, but that hasn't stopped research from progressing. So in April of last year and a few months later in 2016, um, two different Chinese research groups have published studies in which they use CRISPR to edit human embryos. Now, these were embryos that were leftovers, essentially, from in vitro fertilization and that were, had other problems, so they were non-viable. Um, but these groups demonstrated that CRISPR does work in human embryos. And, um, and it, it doesn't work perfectly. So they were able to make some changes, but there were also lots of off-target effects where changes would happen elsewhere in the genome. So we're not there yet, um, but experimentation is happening, even though science as a whole is really nervous. But the thing about CRISPR and the thing about biotechnology in general is that it doesn't have to be large scale. So the equipment to use CRISPR is pretty inexpensive and fits in a garage. Right? Any molecular biology lab on campus can use CRISPR and could probably work with human embryos if they really wanted to. And in fact, there's an active group called DIY Bio of people who call themselves biohackers who are, who are interested in basically doing molecular biology at home. 
And so just like the computer revolution began in people's garages, this group advocates that the biotechnology rev revolution is going to begin in people's garages. And so using sec sort of secondhand equipment and things like that, um, people are doing all sorts of experiments. And so that again raises a question of how can society regulate the genetic engineering of human offspring, and even can we? And so, um, I hope this introduction, however brief, has given you some insights into what I think is going to be a really important question in the next, say, decade going forward, which is that CRISPR is genetic, dramatically expanding the possibilities of genetic engineering. And the big question now is, now that the technology is here, how can humanity use this technology responsibly? Um, we could use it to revive extinct animals and fix some of the environmental damage that we have wrought as we've expanded across the globe. We could use it to eliminate diseases from our children. But we could also use the technology in ways that I think open and raise a lot of ethical questions. And so, um, I'd like to close just by asking for your questions and saying that I would really like to hear your thoughts and let's start a discussion here about how and why we might use the technology and what we as scientists and we as the public who can influence our governments should be thinking about shaping policy. Thank you.